Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. I am at Earthquaker Devices headquarters in Akron, Ohio. We're with Jamie Stillman, founder of the company. It's great to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having us come over to visit. You gave us a tour. We've been chatting here, but I thought we might have a little bit of fun mm -hmm. because you're the uh, the man who actually designs all the pedals. You have yeah. the ideas and you put them to work with your band and, and you're using them every day. So my question for you is, what are your favorite Earthquaker Devices pedals? Well, I just happen to have them right here on How a pedal board. That? that is convenient, isn't it? You yeah. said you're taking that off to Japan <laughs> or somewhere, right? I am, yeah. <laughs> I leave for Japan in a couple days and I'm going to give a demo on my favorite products. Well, perfect timing. Yeah. So tell us what what, uh, what you have here, uh, give us a little demo, and, okay. uh, and tell us why you, you have these pedals on your board. So first, I have the Speaker Cranker. It is a one-knob overdrive. And the start of the Speaker Cranker, I probably used this for two or three years before I ever even considered making it an Earthquaker pedal. Mm -hmm. I was using a Music Man HD 130, which is a solid state preamp. I know, well, yeah. yep. yeah. It's kind of like a very loud bass man. Right. Um, I loved that amp, but just kind of felt like it wasn't quite dirty enough. I wanted a little bit more character from the preamp because it's completely flat mm -hmm. sounding, which works great if you're trying to, you know, get louder and louder and louder. You can keep throwing boosts at it all day and it'll stay clean and keep doing its thing or sub octaves, which is why I was using it because mm -hmm. I did a lot of that, just raising and lowering the volume and using a lot of octave pedals. Speaker cranker just adds just enough grit pretty much for I set it somewhere usually between noon and I would say three o'clock depending on what the guitar is that I'm using. But to me it added sort of uh, not, so, not so much like a Marshall type breakup but more of what it would sound like if you were overdriving the, like a preamp of a Fender. Okay. So it's kind of a gritty Right. I don't know how to really explain that tone, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so why don't you why don't you show so, us the the amp without any of the pedals engaged, and then then show us what yeah. the uh, speaker cranker is doing. So this is a Supro Thunderbolt. That's what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And here's what the pedal. It's very touch sensitive, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, really responsible so, to your picking attack. Yeah, and you know, that's why that's what I feel like gives it that amp kind of character. Just if you just change just a little bit, it'll respond quickly and nice. pretty well. Nice. Yeah. And what's next? Next is the plumes. Very popular pedal, right? Yeah, it has been uh, it's kind of blown us away at how popular this pedal has become. Yeah. Uh, we released it on August third of this year, two thousand nineteen, for Earthquaker Day. Mm-hmm. And uh, it really took off. I think that, uh, you know, in the first three months, we've sold about 6,000 of them. Wow. Which for us is wild. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. a lot of pedals. It really is. Uh, and again, the Plumes is an old design. Um, we released the Palisades in 2012, which was our first Tube Screamer based pedal. Mm -hmm. And in case anybody doesn't know, a Tube Screamer is sort of like the gold standard for overdrives in the boutique world. Everybody's got at least one. Right. <laughs> uh, for me, for the longest time, I it wasn't a favorite pedal of mine at all. Um, we kept getting requests from people like, Earthquaker should make a Tube Screamer, or which pedal is your Tube Screamer? And finally, Julie was like, you should probably work on a Tube Screamer. <laughs> so <laughs> I uh, bought, you know, an old Tube Screamer, a new Tube Screamer, like just some popular clones of the pedal and kind of made my assessment. And then the end of that was the Palisades, which is a, a huge, very tweakable pedal. Mm -hmm. um, but one of my first ideas for that, uh, you know, uh, 808 bass pedal was the Plumes. Okay. And I just kind of held on to the design in about, three years ago, I put it on my pedal board just to see what it was like and ended up falling in love with it. It just, it, it cuts perfectly. I feel like it has the right kind of crunch, like just high gain enough for me. It's probably as high gain as I like to get. Right. Um, it stacks really well. It cuts. There's a lot of headroom. It's, to me, it just, it just, it, it has more of that original character that draws people to the tube screamer, but uh, just more bite and more just a better frequency response to my ears. Anyway. Right, yeah. right. So there are two hallmarks of that original pedal. Uh, one is that there's some of the dry signal mixed in with the, uh, yeah. the overdriven signal, right? Mm -hmm. And the other one is that kind of characteristic mid-hump. Yeah, so. and it's just, just the way the EQ curve is. And it doesn't really have, it doesn't actually have any other dry signal in. It's just the frequency at which it starts clipping. It, you can kind of, 
uh, hear the clean undertone better. Okay. Um, not a favorite characteristic of mine, but <laughs> what it does do is I think it adds to the clarity. So I kind of kept that within the plumes. Just it's, I feel like it's a pretty clear and bold sound, I would say. All right, let's hear it. All right. Yeah. Volume there up. we go. Yep. We got that. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. So that's pretty much my favorite setting for this pedal, too. I always keep it in mode one. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of the tone rolled almost all the way back, which I would say if you do that on a typical Tube Screamer, it's, it's very dark. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the first things that I tried to clean up is just not making it muddy anywhere. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and then I usually keep the gain right at noon. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So next on the board is a uh, that's just the Data Corruptor, which is such a fun pedal. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I love playing with this pedal on my own. I could just hit one note and listen to what happens forever. Right. Um, and, you know, typically, actually, when I design stuff, that is how what I'm listening to. I'll hit a note or a chord and just listen to what happens. Mm -hmm. I just like hearing what, you know. As the note decays, what goes on inside the circuit, just how it sounds. This is one of my favorite things I really love. When I, I set the frequency modulator section in the glide mode, so the note quickly dives down when you stop playing, and I love that sound. Right. So let's, you know, let's hear it. I'll show you. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so did this pedal, the idea for this pedal come to you from wanting that sound? Or how, how do you get the idea for a, a sound like that? Well, so we have the Bit Commander, which is sort of, you know, square wave octaves, mm -hmm. uh, monophonic, very synth sounding pedal. I wanted to do something similar to that, but with harmonies like we had done with uh, this pedal. It's now just continued called the Pitch Bay, which was a polyphonic harmonizer. And there's a very, like, it's a little bit of folklore, I think, because I say it's very popular, but I think there's less than 100 of them in the world. The okay. Schumann PLL, uh -huh. which is, you know, pretty much uh, the way that the frequency division and multiplication is done on this pedal is the same way it's done in the Schumann pedal. And that's pretty much where the similarities between the two actual circuits stop. But that, I wanted to make something that had that kind of division and multiplication with the tone of the Big Commander and make it very controllable, so you knew what was going to happen every time. The Schumann PLL is very wild. It's a very wild, unpredictable <laughs> pedal, um, and just make it repeatable, and then be able to, you know, choose where the signals come from to get divided and multiplied, and be able to mix them all individually. And that is pretty much how the data That's worker came about. around. I mean, a majority of the work was spent trying to maintain it, like trying to get it to be controllable, <laughs> to right. come up with a good preamp <laughs> in it. The frequency division and multiplication part was done in like 10 seconds. And uh, I think that's what makes the sound of the pedal so unique and right. usable. Right. Um, and I'm very happy with the way that it came out, but it did uh, throw me for a loop while <laughs> designing. I spent, I, I spent hours in my office just doing this. Oh, just spent hours going. <laughs> To see what would happen, and I'm sure everybody was going crazy. Like, I'm not kidding, I would spend eight hours a day all week long doing right. that, trying to see how long the note would sustain, what would right. happen as you let go. Right. It, is, uh, it made me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, I do all of my schematics by hand, so I have these notebooks, and there's like eight pages of data corruptor schematics, and it's like, it starts out data corruptor, date, data corruptor, final, data corruptor, final two. By the end of it, final, for real, this is actually the fight, and it gets bigger and more angry, <laughs> and it's like, you can tell how irritated I was even at myself for like, right. <laughs> how many times I've adjusted the filtering on this right. pedal, but... Yeah, I spent a long time on the weirdest stuff. That's with so this great. Thing. And I do think people were actually going nuts by the end of it. <laughs> yeah, I bet. That is so awesome.
And next up, you have the Hummingbird. The hummingbird, yeah, it's an old pedal. I think mm -hmm. they're probably the oldest on this uh, board. Um, hummingbird, the heart of it was based on the Vox Repeat Percussion. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But that, a, that one I'm not familiar with. It's no. an old pedal that had, I don't actually remember off the top of my head what controls it had. It might have had a hard, soft, or slow, fast switch and a rate control, but it was a box. It was like one of those effects you're supposed to just plug into your guitar. Okay. It's plastic. You control it. It's a, it was a very noisy pedal. Totally impractical. Mm -hmm. uh, but I love the sound of it. It's, it's, it's like a, a, a ramp tremolo, more than a sine wave or square wave. And it's very pingy and pulsy and totally intrusive. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> when it's on, it takes over everything. And I just I love the way it sounds. It's also kind of that classic, like, uh, like Valco trim, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I love the way it sounds. Right. I should say that you know the heart of it is based on that, and the, you know I added more control to it, cleaned it up, lower noise, gave it some more options for rate, and I'm, I've been really happy with it ever since. All right. Let's hear what you do with it. All right. Yeah, it has such a hard chop to it. Yeah, that it's uh, you know most tremolos are kind of based on trying to recreate that vintage amplifier mm -hmm. tone, which is great. That's that's fine. But this is such a I, I like your word ping. It has such a hard hard attack. Yeah, there's there's a couple. I just feel like there's there's something very unique about it. There's like that initial like build up to it, which to my ears kind of sounds like a classic Fender tremolo. But then at the very end of it, there's that pinging attack when it hits the top of the yeah. waveform. Is when you combine that with distortion or you know, other stuff. It's. It, I feel like it becomes very interesting. That's like sort of the, the final ingredient for making anything synth sound. I feel like. Right. <laughs> Had that pulse to it. Yeah. Right? That's awesome. And we have the Grand Orbiter. Yeah, Phaser. Inspired by the Ross Phaser. Mm -hmm. You remember the Ross Company? It was a really dirty, kind of nasty sounding Phaser. I felt like it got real deep, but it was just missing something that put it over the edge. So right. I kind of deconstructed that idea and rebuilt it. And it's also an old pedal. I think one of the earliest ones that I ha came up with, I think it came out in 2007. Not many changes have happened to it circuit-wise. I've shrunk it down on the enclosure, but it's pretty much stayed the same since it came out. It has been consistently one of my favorite pedals. I use it all the time in every band I've ever been in. Yeah. Phaser is, you know, right, probably right behind delay. If you just throw distortion out the window, because <laughs> right. I don't consider it an effect, uh, <laughs> um, is probably my favorite effect. I, was, I love it, but it sort of ended my search for other phaser pedals. <laughs> I don't really buy a lot of old phasers or new phasers or anything, because I always, I just love the way that the Grand Orbiter sounds, which feels weird to me. You know, like, <laughs> that's why you built I it. I made it. Yeah, uh, that, that's why you. But built you know, it. I'm always interested in other stuff. Just phaser. I was like, I got that covered. Right. Don't worry. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you don't need another don't have one. To go there, right? Yeah. Right. But yeah, I just love. It. I love the way that this thing sounds. <laughs> So I have to ask, I think you said earlier when we were chatting that you sometimes use the Hummingbird and the Grand Orbiter together. Is that true? Yeah. So one of my favorite combinations, and this is why these three are kind of on the board together, is you know the Data Corruptor or the Big Commander. I could go either way into the Hummingbird and the Grand Orbiter. Uh -huh. So, I mean, I could show you what that sounds like. I would love to hear it. <laughs> Thank you. 
That is a big, mean sound. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> you could feel that. Yeah, as, as well as as well as you. Yeah, there's there's something to that combination. As like you know the, the when I think when the grand orbiter sweeps low and it picks up all the sub harmonics from the data corruptor, and then with you get that additional ping that's sort of moving it along. Is there's a lot going on. Yeah, I think no in doubt. just a simple you know single note really. Right. So, right. That's awesome. Yeah. And what do you have wrapping the board up? Avalanche run. Mm -hmm. Delay and reverb. So the idea for this kind of came from we got we had a we have a pedal called the Dispatch Masters, mm -hmm. a small delay and reverb. When that pedal came out, there weren't very many, if any, pedals like that on the market. This is a really simple, easy to use delay and reverb in one small package, and it was wildly popular. And we kept getting requests for you know stereo version, tap tempo, all these features, and it was sort of. Uh, you know, one of the few instances where it's like, I could see that. I could see a use for that. It might be kind of nice to do. And simultaneously, we were looking for a way to be able to make more uh, feature-heavy effect pedals. So, you know, some kind of digital platform that was more powerful than what we had available to us that, you know, we could develop from the ground up with pretty much anything in mind. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, we developed that platform and the Avalanche run simultaneously. It's the first pedal built on that platform. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a mono delay with a stereo output and a stereo reverb okay. on it. Uh, and it has three modes of operation, one being just a normal delay and reverb, one being a swell reverb, so it responds to your pick attack, it swells in, and then the reverse delay. And what a lot of people might not know <laughs> is that we actually have a patent <laughs> on the way the reverse delay works on this pedal, which is sort of, I'm not patting myself on the back, but it's sort of hard yeah. to get a patent in the United States on something like delay. Yeah, it right. It's been done over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and our, you know, not to, not to get too boring on this, but like our IP attorney was like, I have never seen anything move through so quick. Wow. Congratulations. So, wow, that's great. You know, it's kind of that, that also makes it unique for mm -hmm. us. The engineer who worked on the pedal thought it was so unique that we should submit it. And I was like, sure, why not? And then I was, I was just as shocked when it came through. That's awesome. Um, but typically the way I use it is just normal operation, little bit of reverb, just regular delay. Um, the way the tone control on this works is it, 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 you know, it cuts the highs counterclockwise, boosts the highs clockwise. I leave it dead center, which it just takes the EQ out. It's a pretty flat digital delay, but with just a little bit of analog character to it. We listen to so many different types of delay while developing this, and I would kind of put it somewhere between, you know, a tape delay and a bucket brigade delay, okay. but with just enough, like, kind of articulation of a digital delay that it just sort of marries all of those things together perfectly to my ears. Right. Um, and then the reverb is, it's a lot more atmospheric, I would say, than the Dispatch Master. It imparts way more character. It gets very big. I've been happy with it. It took right. a very long time to work on it. Right. And uh, every time I use it, I'm like, oh, that sounds really good. <laughs> <laughs> Rarely does that happen. That's I'm nice. usually thinking, I should fix that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it. So do you generally run it in mono or is that a stereo delay? Do you run it in stereo? Uh, you know, I <laughs> almost always exclusively use mono. Yeah? Yeah. I never, I'm never, uh, I don't get too wild with my guitar setups. Yeah? Very occasionally in my basement or something, I'll plug in two amps and run it out through there. But most part, usually just mono. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So is this a board that you could take on stage with your band and uh, and do the gig? Definitely. Yeah? Yeah. I think that this is all I, this is all I would need. The data corruptor would be that extraneous, I'll just throw this in and see what happens pedal. <laughs> On my right. actual pedal board, I have other things to do that in, but yeah, I could 
pretty much do anything with this. That's awesome. Yeah. Throw a tuner on there and you're, you're ready to yeah. go. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Jamie, thanks so much for giving us a tour and a little insight into to these six different pedals. It's, it's just fun to check them out and, and fun to uh, to hear from the source where they where they came from and what you do with them. Great thank to you. see you. Thanks again. And thank you for joining me here at Earthquaker Devices headquarters. We are in Akron, Ohio, and I am Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. <laughs>